um, talking about ventilation another case and we're gonna pull it into something we haven't talked about yet which will be fun and I don't, spoiler alert I don't want to spoil it so I won't tell you no spoiler <laughs> alert unless you read the message in the whatsapp forward that closely anyway so we've got mrs. BT she's a 55 year old female she came to casualty she's been complaining of increased cough difficulty breathing for the last three days and this morning was con confused and could not get out of bed her stats on room air are 72 her respiratory rate is 18 her heart rate is 115 her blood pressure is 110 on 80 when you listen to her she's got coarse crackles and expiratory wheezes throughout and she was started on an inhaler three years ago the family doesn't know which one what are you gonna do you're the casualty mo for the day what are you gonna do go okay good let's give her oxygen easy first step all right so we put her on oxygen what else do you want to do put her on oxygen her saps come up chest x-ray good what else nebulize what do you want to nebulize Subutamol, good. What else? Any other tests you want to do? ABG? Yeah. You're in a ventilator lecture. ABG is usually a good guess. <laughs> yes, ABG. Also, anytime you have someone with respiratory distress and decreased level of consciousness, that should make you think, am I in respiratory acidosis? All right, so respiratory distress and new confusion should point you to a blood gas. So, you do a blood gas. You're, oh, wow, you cannot see that at all, can you? Let me change that. pH is 718. Your PCO2 is 96. Your bicarb is 35, and your PO2 is 120. How would you interpret that gas? Let me put it up for you guys in a way you can see it. That's better. Are we, yeah, so it's respiratory acidosis. Uh, is the, uh, are we fully or partially, com partially compensated? Good. Um, your SATs are 100 on 15 liters non-rebreather. You've got an infiltrate to the right lower lobe. And your CBC has, this is what happens when a respiratory therapist gives you CBC results. You have a high white count and a high hemoglobin. What is wrong with that DM? Differential diagnosis. COVID. All right. Ah, COVID is a good thing. We are, you know, COVID test rat negative. Any other guesses? So what do we know, right, for her history? We know she takes an inhaler for three years, okay? We are in a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. When we listened to her, she had some wheezes and crackles. She's hypoxic, hypercarbic. Asthma? Any other guesses from asthma? She's retaining CO2, yeah, acutely or chronically? Chronic. So do we have a chronic condition with an acute problem on top of it? Acute exacerbation of what? COPD. Why am I not saying asthma? How do we differentiate between asthma and COPD? The lazy way. Okay. I like to teach you guys the lazy way sometimes. When does asthma usually start? 
children, right? And the causes of it are genetic, allergens, right? But it's early onset, right? Sometimes people get it into their early 20s. Do we ever diagnose asthma in someone who's 50? How do people get COPD? Irritants such as biomass fuel. So any women in this, not any, many women in this country who have cooked over a cold Jico, right? Smokers, we don't have a lot of those, which is good. Um, but if they're a female with shortness of breath and they have lived where they've cooked with a Jico, they are at risk for COPD, right? When, if she's been on an inhaler for three years, this is probably COPD, right? Okay, so what should we do with this lady? So we put her on oxygen and we have this blood gas. Did we fix her? We're nebulizing her, but it, nothing really seems to. Does COPD respond quickly to nebulization? Not usually, right? So what are we gonna do? Now you're thinking this is a course about ventilators. What do you think we're going to do? But I've also told you, don't intubate a patient with COPD. Ah, so what do we do? BiPAP. Ah, aha, trick. So what is BiPAP? We'll talk about that. And BiPAP, bi means what? Two. P-A-P stands for positive airway pressure. Okay. So we're going to talk about a lot of PAPs. BiPAP, CPAP, EPAP, IPAP. All right, PAP <coughs> is positive airway pressure, and then you gotta figure out what the first letter or two means, okay? So what BiPAP means is we're ventilating with a mask rather than putting a tube in, okay? So the machine, because we're saying BiPAP, the machine is giving two pressures. Usually the patient drives their own rate. So the patient starts a breath and the machine goes from a low pressure then up to the high pressure. Sawa? So advantages, they don't have a tube. If it were you, would you want to be intubated? No, there's no tube. So you don't need as much sedation or any. The patient can breathe through their own airway. They can talk, they can cough, they can do all those things that we like to do. They can sort of eat. The other nice thing about BiPAP is you wanna take it off, you take it off. You wanna put it back on, you put it back on. The disadvantage is it doesn't protect the airway, okay? So often we're intubating a patient to protect their airway. They're a head injury, they're a poisoning, they have meningitis, they're eclamptic, they've dropped their GCS, and we're going to put a tube in to protect their airway, prevent aspiration, right? So in BiPAP, are we protecting the airway? No. What happens if they're wearing this mask and they vomit? They aspirate. So we're actually putting their airway, if they cannot protect their own airway, at more risk, okay? Um, patients can get claustrophobic, right? They're wearing this mask, it's blowing air in them, they might not like it. And then it has to work. It has to fit right, you have to get everything working. It has to all come together. However, BiPAP is the best treatment for ventilatory failure in COPD. Sometimes I think and I think I do this as well. I don't want to intubate. Let's just do BiPAP as well. And it's, you know, like the not as good way, but maybe we can pull them through. You know, I don't need to put a cast on this broken arm. I can just splint it because I'm lazy. I don't know. I don't know anything about broken arms. Um, but right, we sometimes feel like it's a lesser treatment and we are not giving the patient the best treatment because we don't want to because it's a big step. For certain patients, BiPAP is the best treatment. Sawa? And COPD is one of them. So... Let's talk a little bit more what BiPAP. I talked about EPAP, CPAP, PEEP, IPAP, pressure support, enough to make you scream, yes? So again, CPAP, PAP is positive air airway pressure. The C stands for continuous, okay? If it's continuous, are we giving one pressure or are we giving two pressures? One, 
right? So people say, what's the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? CPAP is one pressure. BiPAP is two pressures, all right? So on CPAP, the pressure is going to be constant. doesn't matter if they're breathing in or out. They're going to have that pressure of five or six or eight or 10 or 12. Generally, you're going to set it five to 12. You're setting it, it's a pressure that they're going to breathe out against when they exhale. So if you understand the concept of PEEP, we talked about PEEP last week or the week before, and I showed you that video, yes, right, and how PEEP can open up the lungs and make things better. So CPAP does the same, okay? It'll help open up the lungs. What are some other reasons we use CPAP? Any guesses? Hmm? Heart failure, right? In heart failure, CPAP, uh, we like to think of the fact that that expiratory pressure pushes the fluid out of the alveoli. It doesn't quite work like that, but you're allowed to think that. It's fine. Um, the way, the more accurate way to look at it is if you've got an alveoli full of fluid, and maybe it's half full of fluid, what the CPAP does is it pushes it so it kind of spreads it around the whole alveoli so you can still get through. The other thing of what does positive pressure do to venous return? Decreases. So it's going to prevent your fluid overload from getting worse. Okay? Because um, you're just going to keep the blood out in the peripheral. So what else do we use CPAP for? This one we don't see so often. In Kenya, is real common in North America. It's equally common, I think, in Kenya. We just diagnose it more often in North America. Sleep apnea, <laughs> right? Obstructive sleep apnea. And what that does um, is when people sleep, their soft tissues fall back and close their airways, okay? And so at night when they hit deeper sleeps, they're trying to breathe in. <laughs> and they're snoring, and they can't get any air to enter in. What CPAP does is provides positive pressure that splints that airway open, allowing air to move back and forth, okay? So patients are on home CPAPs with a mask, and look around at some of your consultants in the morning and see if you see lines on their face, and you can see who has CPAP. Uh, we have a few. <laughs> Not naming names. <laughs> But you will see the lines from the strapping or the, from the headgear. Okay, so that is CPAP. One pressure helps for hypoxia, helps for sleep apnea. Those are the big ones. Sawa? Then we talk about BiPAP. So BiPAP is two pressures. The base or the lower pressure we call EPAP, expiratory positive airway pressure. I think of it as PEEP with the letters kind of unscrambled, right? PEEP stands for positive and expiratory pressure. So if you're thinking of setting them, think of them as the same. PEEP, EPAP, same thing, okay? Then we have a pressure above your EPAP called your IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure, okay? So if you have a low pressure and then we increase the pressure to a higher pressure to take a breath in, the difference between the two of them is the same as pressure support on a ventilator, okay? So your IPAP, as soon as the patient breathes in, the machine gives an extra push to help that patient breathe so they can get larger volumes. Sawa? So, does that make sense? So you've got EPAP, which is the same as PEEP. You've got IPAP, which is your inspiratory pressure, or the difference between your EPAP and your IPAP is your pressure support. Una elewa? Sawa. Okay. So... Then we're going to talk for a moment about type 1 versus type 2 respiratory failure. Sometimes we call them respiratory failure and ventilatory failure, but I think you guys like to use type 1 and type 2, yes? So type 1, they have trouble oxygenating, yes? So these patients generally need PEEP or EPAP or CPAP. They need that pressure on exhalation to keep fluid away, to open up their lungs, to recruit, to prevent obstruction, okay? Type 2, they're having trouble getting CO2 out. They need more ventilation. 
So we can do that by either a larger tidal volume, which is more IPAP, right? A higher pressure support, or make them breathe more. We can, on some BiPAP machines, set a rate. And sometimes we do, but it's generally more comfortable if the patient does their own rate. Because it's uncomfortable if you have a mask on your face and all of a sudden it's pushing air into you when you're not ready for it. So BiPAP helps with type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure, but you need to know what you're treating so you know what to set. Sawa? So let's talk about it. If you have type 1 respiratory failure, you can do CPAP or BiPAP. The biggest thing they need is PEEP, right? So when we are here, sometimes you have seen me do BiPAP in two different ways. Sometimes we're doing it on a vent, and sometimes we're doing it on the small little machines, yes? The advantage of a vent is you can set FiO2 of 100%, okay? The small little machine alarms less, which is sometimes nice. Um, but the oxygen is being teed into the circuit. So you're only going to give maybe 50% oxygen maximum. So if you have a patient who's satting 60 on a non rebreather, do you want to put them on the little machine that will only give them 50% oxygen? No, you're going to pull out the vent that can give 100% oxygen. So if you're anticipating needing a lot of oxygen, do this on the vent, okay? Normally, if they are having type 1 respiratory failure, they're hypoxic, I'm going to start with an EPAP or a PEEP of eight or more. And then I'm going to increase it slowly by slowly, making sure the patient is comfortable until I start to see their SATs getting better or until I start to see the FiO2 being able to come down, until I see an effect from it. Um, if you're doing CPAP, then you're done. You've set your one pressure. You've seen oxygenation improve. Great. If you're doing BiPAP, your patient might be a little bit more comfortable because when they go to take a breath in, the machine gives them an extra boost of air, okay? So what you want to do is titrate that IPAP or that pressure support two to set it two to four above your EPAP. Does that make sense? So if my I start out, I have the patient on an EPAP and I set it at eight and the SATs are, you know, still 85 and then I go to 10 and the SATs come up to 90, okay. Then I'm going to set, so I've got an EPAP of 10. Then I'm going to increase my pressure, my IPAP to maybe 14. So every time the patient breathes in, he gets a pressure of 4, taking him from 10 to 14 to help him breathe in. Sawa? So type 2 respiratory failure or ventilatory failure. This patient needs BiPAP, right? <laughs> We need to get the CO2 out. We need them to ventilate more. One pressure isn't going to be enough to make that happen. They need more pressure. So this one, you can use a small BiPAP machine because they need the pressure more than they need the oxygen. Um, thankfully, now we usually have enough ventilators that we can use the large vent most of the time. Um, but if we're struggling, we can. So this patient, maybe this is a patient with a neuromuscular disease right? They aren't able to take decent volumes because they're having a myasthenias gravis crisis. Um, they don't need a lot of PEEP, right? We don't need to open up their lungs. We just need to get more air in and out. So here we're going to do an EPAP of five or six, okay? We never go below five. Maybe for a PEED we'll go four, but never go lower than that. You're just wasting your time. You've got the nice machine, use it. But then they're going to need a larger delta, more pressure support to get more volume. So you're going to do an IPAP of 6 to 10 to reach an adequate volume, okay? This is where it gets a little bit challenging. The BiPAP machine will give you a number for the volume. However, is 100% of the air leaving the machine going inside the patient or is it leaking along the way? It's leaking, right? The mask is going to leak. So the machine is trying to compensate, but your volumes are going to be a little bit erratic. And so don't chase them like you would someone on a ventilator to get exactly six to eight mils per kilo. If I'm getting a reasonable volume and I have good air entry, so I. So our patient, Mrs. BT, was that her name? Yes. What, should, what type of respiratory failure does she have? 
type two with a little bit of type one, right? So what do we want to put her on now that we've learned how BiPAP works? What does she need for her settings? Does she need CPAP or BiPAP? BiPAP, okay. Should we do it on the vent or the little machine? The vent or machine, which one? I'd probably do the vent just because her saps are heavey heavey, but if I had to, I'd do the little machine. If I was in casualty still, the little machine works better there. Um, so what setting should we start? What should we program in for her EPAP? Who's, pick a number. Who's got a guess? Let's say eight. Sawa? EPAP of eight. What should we set her IPAP to? We set her EPAP to eight. What should we set her IPAP to? Hmm? 16. So we would say those settings are 16 on eight. Okay? So you put her on, and the machine keeps ringing apnea. And you look at her, and you can see her trying to breathe. But it keeps saying apnea, apnea, apnea. And then you go, I'm done. This machine is stupid. I'm going to call Annette and go home. Yes? The machine is not stupid. The problem is COPD patients are annoying. They do something called dynamic compression. And I am not an artist, and I tried to find an animation of this, but I couldn't. So and I can't even spell properly. Anyway, so this is a normal, this is an alveoli, and this is a diaphragm, OK? So normally what happens, right, our diaphragm contracts and we breathe in and we have oxygen in there coming in and then the CO2 is going to go out. Yes? Normal? We're all good? Now you have a patient with COPD. What happens with COPD is the tissues holding the area around the airway break down. So you end up with really floppy airways, okay? So you have a patient who's sick. Normally, we try to actively, in, we actively inhale, right? And we just passively exhale, right? We let the air flow out. But if someone is sick, they're trying to breathe faster, so you're going to try to force your exhalation, yes? So what happens when you forcefully exhale is we increase the pressure around the alveoli and around the airway. So what happens to the airway? Collapses. So, did any of that oxygen and CO2 leave and nitrogen? No. Okay, then we breathe in, and what happens? Negative pressure, right? We can get more air in, yes? And then we go to exhale again, and what happens? Collapse. And so our alveoli start growing, okay? And blowing up like giant balloons. This is air trapping or dynamic compression, okay? So similar how I said we use CPAP with someone with obstructive sleep apnea to prevent their tissues from closing their airways, we can also use CPAP in COPD patients to increase the pressure in these airways to allow the oxygen to come in and the CO2 to go out, okay? Does that make sense? Um, Patients do this on their own. You will sometimes have a COPD or come into casualty and you will see them breathing like this. I want you guys to all do this right now. Purse your lips and breathe out. Are you doing it? Do you feel that pressure in the back of your throat? Right? The patient is creating their own back pressure to help get all the air out, okay? So, for our Mrs. BT, who we put on 16 on eight, if the pressure in the alveol around here, and we're so air trapped out, is 10 or 12, she's got more pressure in the, her lungs than the machine is giving her. So when she tries to breathe, the machine says, your pressure is too high, I don't need to give you air. All right, so 
you need to match whatever pressure is existing in the lungs, that auto peep, to the pressure you set. So a bad COPD ear, even though I said they're more of a type 2 failure and they need a peep of 5 to 6, I said unless dynamic compression, which is where they're air trapping, then you need to match it, okay? So we're going to put her on a higher pressure, right? Um, so we're going to give her, like we said, a larger IPAP, and we're going to give her an increased EPAP so we can let that air exit out. Does that make sense? Um, so we put her on, instead of 16 on 8, we did 16 on 12, okay? So that's an IPAP of 16, an EPAP of 12, which equals a pressure support of 4. Her GCS starts to improve. We do a repeat ABG, 732, CO2 of 65, bicarb 32, and a PO2 of 70. And then we can start to take her off the BiPAP for short tri trials, okay? Does that make sense? So what I want to explain, if you're doing BiPAP on a vent, there's not a mode on the vent called BiPAP. You need to go, some of the vents have a non-invasive option, NIV, non-invasive ventilation, is another way of calling BiPAP. Some places we call it bi-level. There's too many names just to keep me employed. Um, so, but there's not a BiPAP mode where you can set an IPAP or an EPAP on the vent. But what mode is this identical to that we've been talking about? We don't have a set rate. You have a PEEP and you have a pressure support. What mode is that? Pressure support mode, right? So if you are doing this on a vent, if you have the option of going to non-invasive, go to non-invasive because it will alarm less. And then you put on NIV pressure support. So then I would set my PEEP to 12 and my pressure support to four. Sawa? To get those same settings. And then whatever FiO2 I need. Questions? about BiPAP? Akunaswali? So just like when you are doing ventilation, as you increase the PEEP, you may see drops in blood pressure, yes? And this is really important when you have a rheumatic heart patients because they're having respiratory distress and we think, oh, let's put them on BiPAP, and then we put them on BiPAP and we have no blood pressure, okay? So you have to weigh what is worse, what am I dealing with? Because um, rheumatic heart defect patients drop their blood pressures really fast on, blood, on BiPAP. Okay, we're going to do another case because I still have time. So you got Mr. KJ. He came to casualty in severe respiratory distress, respiratory rate of 18, heart rate 140, SAT 78. He refuses to lie down and said he's kind of sitting up, leaning over. States he has been using his inhaler since midnight, but has no relief. You decide to do a blood gas. It's 737, CO2 of 40, bicarb of 22.3. Wow, I was precise. You listen to his chest and you hear nothing. What do you think is going on with this guy so far? He's 18 years old. Asthma. Severe asthma. So we throw everything at him because he looks horrible. We do continuous salbutamol. We give him magnesium, which I don't know how to spell. Steroids. We even give him sub-Q epi. And he's becoming increasingly restless and agitated. What do you do? All right, you do an x-ray, super hyperinflated. What are we gonna, what are we gonna do? He's getting, his stats are starting to drop, He's getting confused. He keeps pulling his mask and his oxygen off. Again, Annette said never intubate an asthmatic, but this one needs to be intubated. <laughs> so, there is debates about BiPAP in asthma. The studies don't show great success. Anecdotally, some people have had some success. For me, 
if it's someone, a lot of asthma that's poorly treated can turn into COPD. And how many asthmatics around here are, are well treated? None. So if this is a 45 year old or a 40 year old, I might try BiPAP saying I've got a component of COPD in here as well. If he's 18 at this point, I probably will intubate him. What? But his blood gets, so you know what? You say let's intubate him, but we're gonna do a blood gas first again. So you do another blood gas, 736, CO2, 39, bicarb 22. Do we wait for him to get acidotic before we intubate? They actually say if you have an asthmatic who's in distress with a normal blood gas, that is the time to intubate. Because asthmatics are often young and healthy, so they have a strong ability to breathe. So when they're in distress, they're going to make themselves alkalotic. They're going to breathe their CO2 down. They're going to hyperventilate. As they get sicker, their, pH is, their blood gas is going to return to normal. So a normal blood gas in a bad asthmatic is a bad sign. When your blood gas, because you've probably got, and you're, you're getting acutely worse, okay? So we decide to intubate him. You sedated him, paralyzed, got a tube in, secured it at 22 centimeters. You bag a few times and it's going easy and all of a sudden it becomes more and more difficult to bag. And your heart rate and sats are now dropping. Why? Anybody know? This happens often if you intubate an asthmatic. Air trapping, right? So we get nervous, we've gone to intubate them, and asthmatics, you can squeeze that air in. But they need a long time to ex exhale, okay? I was at a code today on medicine, and we had some very excited nurses. And they were begging these patients at like 40. I think they did help breathe, help breathe, baby, breathe, breathe, baby, breathe. I don't know. This patient was 50, did not need breathe, baby, breathe. He did slower. Asthmatics need really slow, okay? Because if you force a breath in and you don't let them exhale and you force a breath in, you're getting them fuller and fuller and fuller. So then you can't squeeze more air in. Their sats might come down. Why is his heart rate dropping and his blood pressure? It's almost like you've given him attention pneumothorax. You, you haven't popped anything yet, but there's so much intrathoracic pressure that you're reducing venous return. So what do you do? His heart rate's dropping, sats dropping. Disconnect the ambu bag, which make, people may think you're crazy because the sats are going down, so you have to bag faster, yes? No. Disconnect the ambu bag. As long as they are still paralyzed, you can grab them around their chest and help them exhale and just squeeze and you and put your ear next to the tube and you can hear for a really long time then give them one breath it will be easy and then do it again and do it again then you put him back on the beggar, and what rate should you bake him at? Should we go back to begging at 20? 30? 10. 10 is a good number. Uh, right? They don't need, or sorry, they need a really long exhalation time to let all that air out. So you got to reduce your rate to allow that to happen. So when you need... The biggest thing to remember if you have an asthmatic on a vent is they need a long time to exhale. All of your ventilation goals should be about long time to exhale, okay? So to do that, you can give them less time to breathe in. More, less time to breathe in equals more time to breathe out, right? We can give them a slow respiratory rate because then they have more time to breathe out. Then I have, we should keep them paralyzed. Why should we keep them paralyzed? Oops. I can set my rate to 10. Is the patient allowed to breathe when they want to? On my vents? On any mode? Yes, on any mode, if the patient wants to breathe, they can breathe. So if they 
feel like they can't breathe, are they going to be happy breathing at a rate of 10? So I need to keep them sedated and possibly paralyzed to keep them at a rate of 10. So we take this patient over and we put them on the vent. We put them on AC volume control. We got them on an FAO2 of 75, which is giving them a SAT of 93. So I'm happy with that. Respiratory rate of 12. Tidal volume, we say 8 to 10 mils per kilo. Because we're breathing so few times, the times we give them a breath, let's make it a little bit bigger, okay? So we talk about something called the IE ratio. This is the comparison of how much time we spend breathing in to how much time we're breathing out. So a normal person takes one second to breathe in, okay? And a normal person breathes, let's say, 12 times a minute. Is that what? So if we're breathing 12 times a minute, how many seconds do we have for each breath cycle? We call it total cycle time. 60 divided by 12. So we normally have five seconds. So we have one second to breathe in and four to breathe out. So a normal IE ratio is one to four, okay? If I'm running up the hill, because you guys paid me 999, what's gonna happen? I'm going to increase my respiratory rate. Normally, we still breathe in for about one second, but I'm going to shorten my exhalation time. So I might go down to one to two. Does that make sense? So IE ratios, some ventilators will have you set this. Anesthesia, most of their machines, if you look at them, say one to two, one to three, one to four, they, that's how they set their machines. Um, and so it's a good way to think of, am I giving enough time to exhale? So we've got this patient. Her ABG, oops, is 725. The CO2 is 55 and the bicarbonate 25. 23. How do you interpret that blood gas? Acidotic or alkalotic? Acidotic. Acidotic. Caused by respiratory or caused by... Respiratory. respiratory. It's a bicarb helping, hurting, or doing nothing? Doing nothing. Doing nothing. So it's an acute respiratory acidosis. So what should we do with this blood gas? Are we happy with this gas? It's worse than we were before we intubated. I thought we said we were helping this patient. Now we made their blood gas worse. Yes? What do we do? How do we fix this blood gas? Or do we fix this blood gas? What, are, what do you normally do if you have someone who's acidotic? What do we normally do? We, right, we were talking about this a little bit before. We need to ventilate them more, get more CO2 out. We need to, they need to either breathe faster or breathe deeper. All right. So if I'm already at 8 to 10 mils per kilo, do I want to increase my tidal volume? Nope. All right, so do I increase my rate from 12? Why are you saying no? What happens when we re increase our rate? What happens to our exhalation time? Shortens. And then we're going to have more air trapping. And then what's going to happen to our CO2? It's going to go higher. Ah, oh, shoot. This is why I tell us not to intubate an asthmatic but they're fun. So there's something called permissive hypercapnia. Okay. And we do this in asthma. We do this in bad ARDS. This is a decision you make and it says, you know what? If my PCO2 is high, eventually the bicarb is going to compensate, assuming my kidneys work, right? And what is worse for the patient? To have a perfect gas and lungs that are beat up, or a heavy heavy gas and lungs that are not being beat up so bad. Heavy heavy. Like let's just make everything heavy heavy, right? So when I started working in Canada, I worked with some RTs who had been around for a long time. And they would tell us, they said, yeah, we used to, our asthmatics, we'd intubate them. And we would have we, they really liked, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they really liked the one ventilator. I don't remember which one. Because they could get the pressures up to 150. And their blood gases would be perfect. And they'd have three chest tubes on each side. And then the patient would die. Isn't that horrible? Right? So now we do what we call protective 
ventilation, lung protective, right? So we're going to do, we're not going to let the pressures go to 150, okay? We're not going to do some of these things because we're okay with a little bit of acidosis. So the, has the pH of 729 killed anybody? No, you got to keep an eye on your blood pressure and your electrolytes and your other shifting, right? But overall, that's not so bad, right? So let's look at this now on my ventilator and let's see what some of the other things we need to watch for when we have an asthmatic patient or a COPD patient. So how do you think if you broke my rules and put a COPD patient on the vent, how would they, how would those settings look the same or different? What do you think? So COPD patients, we said we need a high PEEP, right? We need to match their auto PEEP. And that's because we're trying to balance the PEEP between the airways that are collapsing down. We're trying to pop them open, right? Asthmatics also create their own PEEP, but, right, with that air trapping. But it's just because there's too much air that they did not get out. So if we add more PEEP, is it going to make it easier for that air to get out? No, it's just more air. So asthmatics, you're going to do a low PEEP. You're going to do four or five. Um, otherwise, it's quite similar in how you set it up. So let me give us an asthmatic patient here. Hopefully I do this right. Okay, there's our patient on the ventilator. So uh, I want you guys to look at this purple line that keeps sort of fading. You see this line coming back? How long is it taking that patient to reach baseline? Do you notice how long it's taking? Right? It's taking three or four seconds before it comes all the way back. Normally a patient, this line comes back quite quickly. Okay. So right now, what is my peak pressure? 36. What do we want our peak pressures to be less than? 35. So what should we do if our peak pressure is more than 35? Who remembers from last week? What should we check? Or do we just say, oh, it's higher than 36? What do we check? We talked about peak pressures and plateau pressures, right? The peak pressure is how much pressure it gets to, takes to get in. Plateau is how much pressure it takes to stay in, okay? So to do a plateau, we need to, sorry, I thought I changed this one, do a pause, okay? So we're just going to do a short pause. Hopefully this will work. So we can see, no, it didn't work. It is not behaving on me well today. Sorry. Okay. Maybe we're next. All right, now what's happening to the machine? I did not give it a pause, but what is it doing? What's the machine? Are we ventilating right now? No, we just see these spikes, okay? What's happening? This you see in real life. It's not quite doing it how I want it to. If you can, it says the peak here is 23, but that's wrong. This number here says 40, okay? Meaning the pressure is going up to 40, whenever we see that spike, and my machine stops having a seizure. Um, so 
sorry, I don't know why it's misbehaving. So, okay, here we see the spike. It's going past the 40. So what's happening is the pressure in the machine is reaching 50, which is your alarm, and it's ending the breath, okay? And so we're not really getting much of our air in because it's just doing this quick breath. Um, but what you also will see if the patient has asthma, so you might have to increase their high pressure alarm to make it work for you. Um, because do you expect the patient to have a high peak pressure or high plateau pressure in asthma? What do you think? Do you think they have a high peak or a high plateau? So, what is our peak right now? Thirty. And let me try one more time to check a plateau. Maybe it'll work for me this time. Aha! I see it. Okay. It looks kind of funny. Normally, it would be a straight line up. No, it's not like me. So normally, you have a peak, and then your plateau is actually going to be quite a bit lower in an asthmatic, right? Because their lungs themselves have the ability to take in air well, okay? But they don't, once the air gets to the lungs, the lungs are fine, right? Once it can get past all your tight bronchi bronchi and bronchioles, the alveoli themselves are okay. So you're going to see, oh, there we go. You see that one? So we have a high peak and a lower plateau. Do you see that? Normally this is a line like this, so ignore that strangeness. But that plateau right now is, our peak is 30 and our plateau is 14. Okay. So if I needed to, could I increase the volume on this patient? Or do I risk increasing the pressures too much? If I increase the tidal volume, what's going to change? Let's say this patient is 60 kilos. If I go up on my tidal volume to 600, what's going to change? My ventilator might just start misbehaving, misbehaving again because it doesn't like doing restrictive lung disease. But what's increasing? What did my peak come up to? Thirty-five. What is our plateau? Sixteen. So our peak went up by five. Our plateau only went up by two. Which one's more dangerous to the patient? Peak or plateau? Plateau is more dangerous, right? We want to keep the plateau less than 30, right? So with this patient, if they were hypercarbic, I would probably go up to 600 mils because, yeah, my peak went up a little bit, but my plateau is still okay, right? So I can still see we have this prolonged waveform, okay? So right now I'm on a rate of 10. What happens if, I'm gonna, if I were to increase this patient's rate to 20? What do you think is going to happen? You have a new intern, they're confused. They say we are acidotic and I need to increase the rate. So they come and bring it up to 20. What's going to happen? Anybody know? 
So now notice how we're starting a breath before, it's kind of hard to see because it keeps flickering. But you see how we're not quite reached baseline? All right, the minute volume's going up, that's great. But as the patient gets more and more air in, what's gonna change? They're becoming more and more full of air. What do you expect to happen? You're gonna start to see an increase in your peak pressure and your plateau pressure, okay, because of this air trapping. So does this air trapping only happen to asthmatics or COPD patients? No, we can switch this patient to have ARDS lungs, all right? So now notice our, so here our plateau was 14 and now it is, right? So if we all of a sudden this patient, we unplugged this, hooked up, took the ventilator, you know, the asthmatic died and we took the ventilator and we didn't change anything and we put it on the patient with ARDS, okay? <laughs> What is wrong with our setting? Now we have a peak pressure of 70 and a plateau of, oh boy, is that, this a good idea? What do we need to do to bring to, down the, that pressure? We've gone from an asthma patient to ARDS patient. We need to really reduce that volume, right? 60 kilos we need to be at. 360, right? As ARDS, we want to be four to six mils per kilo. All right, so there we go. Let's try 360. We're coming down, right? So, but now if our patient's acidotic, and we're at a rate of 20, but if our CO2 is high and you have a crazy intern and he says, oh, I want to double it, we go to 40. Are we exhaling fully before the breath? Mostly because ARDS patients, their lungs are so stiff that they push the air out really bad. So then this patient dies. And we go to the next patient. We just hook it up to the next patient. We don't change anything. This patient, this is fun. <laughs> this patient, OPP patients, unconscious. So, okay. Throw them on this patient. We now have a respiratory rate of 40 and a tidal volume of 360. Is this guy exhaling completely? You see that flow waveform? Is he exhaling completely? No, so, right? So this guy is going to start air trapping, right? So it can happen on any patient if the rate gets high enough, okay? And so you need to, it's good to watch on your flow waveform. Sometimes the patient's doing it themselves. Right? If they're trying to breathe fast all on their own, then you can consider some sedation, see if it's a problem. That's harder to fix. But if it's your fault, if you're the one doing it, you're going to cause problems. So watch out for that air trapping on any patient. All right? All right, did I lose you guys? Is the patients kept dying and we kept putting the patient machine on a different patient? No. <laughs> yes. All right. This is why you need to look at the settings before you put it on the next patient. Yes? <laughs> All right, Swally? Yes. So, for our asthma, asthma patient, when you, inc so we are on a volume control mode, right? We are on AC volume right now. So remember, you are always either controlling the volume or the pressure. You're not controlling both, right? When I increase the volume, I'm going to increase the pressure. But the, when I increase the volume, the patient's going to get more pressure, right? Um, I could instead put the patient on a pressure control mode and then control the pressure. I, in my experience, I seem to like volume control a little bit more with asthmatics because I know I have my peak and my plant and I can check them. 
on pressure control, it's one pressure and I don't always have my plateau. So if they're a really bad asthmatic, volume control I find works a little bit better because I can I know I can keep my plateau low. If I was on pressure control, I would have to set my pressure higher to actually get the air in and that same pressure is what's being transmitted to the lungs. So always, so right now I have set a volume of 360. If I, inc and our pressure right now is 22, our peak pressure, right? You see that? So if I increase this volume to 600, because of what's going on in the patient's lungs, our pressures will increase. Right? Because these are patient measured values. On volume control, you control the volume and the pressure is going to depend on what's going on in the patient's lungs and how much volume you're giving. More volume equals more pressure. Does that sort of answer your question? Swali and Guinea? Where yours mud? Yes? All right, we will end there. Thank you guys for coming.